Assalamu alaikum dear student. Uh, I am Dr. Parvez Ahmed. Uh, in today's lecture, uh, we will discuss about future challenges and nanotechnology. Uh, this is the part of the course, uh, Introduction to Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Uh, we have uh, uh, almost, uh, we, we are now almost at the end of the course. So these are the few lectures in which we will uh, cover the remaining course. So let's go to some of the challenges and the nanotechnology. Uh, but before to go into uh, these challenges, uh, first of all, we should discuss uh, some of the well-known uh, nanomaterials or devices, uh, their applications and estimated production rate. I mean, the, uh, how we should discuss that, what are the particular applications uh, which has been based on the uh, particular type of the nanomaterials and how much of that material were being produced in the past and how much it was being uh, predicted uh, in the near futures, uh, which has already been passed. So, uh, uh, you know that we have uh, materials or devices like ceramics, uh, catalyst, composite, coating, thin film, powders, uh, metals, and these kind of the materials that were being uh, designed, they were being fabricated for the particular applications uh, that is related with the structural. I mean, uh, all these kind of materials, uh, they were designed for uh, structural applications. And their product, uh, they were estimated in 2004 uh, as uh, 10 metric tons for years. Uh, I mean, uh, when we are talking about uh, this particular tables, so we remember that this particular tables, you can see here uh, the source uh, that this table that it's been uh, made in 2004. So the estimate uh, that we are that that is given in this particular table as from 2004 from this particular force that is nanoscience and nanotechnologies opportunities and uncertainties. And that has been published in the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering, London, UK. So this is taken from uh, this particular source. Uh, and the data contained in this is from 2004. So according to this particular data, uh, these materials, uh, uh, they were estimated as 10 metric tons for years in 2004 and was predicted uh, to be uh, a 103 metric ton for years uh, and a duration from 2005 to 2010. Uh, similarly, from 2011 to 2020, the product were estimated from 10 raised to power 4 to 10 raised to power 5 metric ton for years. It's a huge amount. So and then we have uh, metal oxide, uh, that is, uh, and metal oxide, the most popular nanomaterials is titanium oxide, uh, zinc oxide, and iron oxide. It's most widely nanomaterials uh, so far we have on the earth. Uh, and you know that these kind of materials mostly utilized in skincare products. Uh, so their product, uh, uh, estimated product in 2004 were 103 metric tons for years. Uh, it was remain. It was, uh, I mean, so the product was estimated to be constant from 2005 to 2010. Uh, and it was uh, 103 metric tons for years. About uh, from 2011 to 2020, the product were estimated uh, uh, more than uh, 10 to the power uh, three. Uh, I mean, uh, estimate was that the product can be increased and product can be decreased from this particular uh, point. Then we have integrated circuits and technology. Uh, so for that particular applications, uh, the materials that we have is single wall nanotubes. Uh, single wall nanotubes normally we mean carbon nanotubes. Uh, we have nanoelectronic, optoelectronic materials, uh, which include titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, iron oxide, uh, Along with that, we have uh, organic light emitting diodes. It's a popular material that we have for uh, ICT and their product estimation uh, was uh, 10 metric tons per year, uh, which were uh, 102 uh, from 2005 to 2010 and uh, 10 to the power three or more from 2011 to 2020. Uh, then we have materials like uh, nano encapsulates, uh, 
targeted uh, drug delivery, biocompatible quantum darts, composite biosensor. And these were the materials uh, that were particularly designed for uh, the application and the field of biotechnology. But their product was uh, very less as compared to the previous product. I mean, their product uh, estimated in 2004 was less than uh, one metric ton for years. And from 2005 to 2010, uh, the estimate was one. Uh, and from 2011 to 20, the estimate was uh, from 10 metric ton to, I mean, uh, the estimate was 10 metric ton uh, from uh, uh, 2011 to 2020. I mean, that was the beginning of the nanomaterials uh, uh, and biotechnology. And then we have uh, uh, the particular applications uh, in the field of uh, instruments, sensor, and characterizations. For that, uh, we have uh, the devices which has been built from the nanomaterials and end of MEMS and microelectronic mechanical system. Similarly, we have NAMS, SPAM. Uh, cleft fam, lithography, direct wire uh, tools. So these were the material or devices that have been designed from nanomaterials to be utilized in applications uh, like instrument sensor and characterizations. Their product were 10, uh, uh, 10 metric tons per year uh, and were estimated to uh, 102 metric tons from 2005 to 2010. Uh, and uh, the estimate increased from 2000 from 10 raised to power 2 to 10 raised to power 3 from 2011 to 2020. Uh, so uh, we also have nanomaterial devices uh, that is uh, nano filtrations, uh, nano membrane uh, that was particularly designed for application and environmental sciences. Uh, uh, we can simply say in the environment related uh, phenomena or problem. And their product was uh, 10 metric tons in 2004 and were estimated uh, 102 metric ton and uh, the duration from 2005 to 2010 and are again predicted to increase from 10 raised to the power 3 to 10 raised to the power 4 uh, and the duration from 2011 to uh, 2020. We remember that uh, these estimations were uh, I mean based on the data uh, that has been taken from uh, 2004. Uh, it might be possible that this estimate might have been increased or, or decreased um, until unless we don't have uh, the data in uh, 2000, uh, uh, that is 2021. So we cannot really say that what had uh, what could have happened with this particular uh, predictions or estimate. So uh, we were talking at the start of the lectures. Uh, we were discussing that uh, we have certain challenges uh, to deal with the nanotechnology and the future. So the first challenge uh, to deal with is to, the challenge to visualize. So uh, the question is how to visualize. Uh, when you come to nanoscience, you know that uh, we have explorations and understanding of the fundamental behavior of the structures having at least one dimension between one and 100 nanometers. That is what we have when we come inside the course uh, nanoscience. And I mean, by, by a short definition, we say that uh, one nano is equal to, uh, one nanometer is equal to 10 raised to the power minus nine meters. Uh, we can say that one nanometer is equal to 3.94 and to 10 raised to the power minus eight inch. So uh, what we have, uh, the challenge to visualize the length scale for most of the researcher working and the field is necessary. So what is the challenge we have? I mean, the first challenge that we have in the future or even in the current time is that how to visualize uh, the nanostructures. You know that the structure is very small. So in order to visualize these small structures, uh, every researcher working in this particular field uh, needs some spectacular and some modern apparatus. Uh, until unless they don't have, they won't be able to visualize. And until unless you don't visualize, so you won't be able to work precisely in the field. Uh, so let's see uh, what we need to visualize uh, this kind of material. So uh, in order to visualize, uh, to analyze the nanomaterials, uh, we have uh, challenges in the future. The challenges in the future is the availability of the resources. I mean, in order to effectively characterize 
uh, to weave the materials, we, knows, we, uh, we need some uh, specialized apparatus. I mean, uh, uh, these apparatus is basically the facility that required to see uh, the object or the material at the nanoscale. Uh, why we don't have these materials? So what is the difficulty or the challenge uh, in these apparatus that are given below? So the first, uh, the, the most, uh, I mean, the common challenge or the most, uh, uh, I mean, common difficulty that we have is uh, the, the prices of the apparatus. I mean, these apparatus, they are very much expensive. Uh, I mean, which can't be by, uh, I mean, the, which, uh, uh, which very difficult for, uh, I mean, for the people working in the third world countries to buy uh, these kind of apparatus. Uh, until unless you don't have these apparatus, you won't be able to analyze or characterize the material properly. So if you don't uh, have the, uh, the ability or the capabilities or the resources to characterize, to properly characterize your synthesized nanomaterials, so you won't be able to know uh, what you have done or what you are doing in the field. So these are some of the apparatus that are most uh, commonly utilized uh, to characterize the nanomaterial. So here you can see that uh, these apparatus and their prices, uh, they are given in this particular uh, uh, this particular slide. That is, uh, if you have uh, a magnifier, so you know that the magnifier has a, um, a price, a most commonly uh, available apparatus, so its price is only $10. I mean, it's not something that we can say it's expensive. I mean, it might be in the range of uh, some of the research you are working in the third world countries. Then we have, I mean, some of the initial apparatus that were available at the time of nanotechnology's development. So optical microscope, uh, you know that the price ranged from $500 to $20,000. Um, I mean, that, that were the apparatus that were available at the early stage of nanotechnology. So then we have the apparatus that is surface of uh, propellometers and its price, market price is from uh, $2,000 to $200,000. Uh, then we have atomic force microscopy, I mean, which is still in use and you know, most of the people working and the modern uh, technologies uh, utilizing this particular apparatus. So the developed countries have uh, this facility in almost every lab, but the third world countries are the people working in the colleges, they don't have um, the availability of this particular apparatus uh, because of their price, they do not have the sufficient funding uh, because funding is... Uh, I mean, so, so one of the great challenges because the, the third world countries, they don't, have, they don't have any funding to buy this kind of apparatus because the money uh, which they should utilize for buying this particular apparatus can be utilized for many other purposes. So that's why they're unable to buy this kind of apparatus. The most commonly, uh, the most common apparatus uh, which is needed in every nano lab uh, without without which we can say that nanotechnology is almost impossible uh, or to do with nanotechnology is almost impossible and that is scanning electron microscopy or transmission electron microscopy that is with the help of which you can see that uh, what actually you have met that is something like you can see that an eye for the nanoscientists I mean an eye for the people for the researcher working in the field of uh, nanotechnology so if you don't have a sim, you don't have the eyes to look at your product. So uh, I think without this apparatus, I think you won't be able to work properly in this particular field. But you can see that it has the price or the value is uh, almost uh, $1 million or even more than that. So this is almost, almost impossible. Uh, uh, I mean, for uh, the third world countries that the universities and the third world countries are the laboratories and third world countries to pay for. So uh, what, they, uh, what they should have, I mean, it's one of the challenges uh, if they're still interested to work uh, without this, uh, this particular apparatus. So what they have to do, they have to collaborate. They have to collaborate with the laboratories or with the universities and some developed countries where they can uh, utilize their resources. I mean, all these resources. So it's the only way to uh, deal with this particular challenge that is uh, we have to collaborate. You have to collaborate with the people, with the scientists and engineers working in the uh, developed countries who have the availability of these resources. So which might help you 
to work in the field of nanotechnology. But still we say that the development, if you're working in a lab and you don't have this facility, so your work or your progress will be very, very slow because you have to wait. You have to wait for the resources uh, to utilize, to analyze your product. And until, unless you don't visualize your product, you don't know that what you have made or what you have synthesized. So this is, uh, I mean, one of the greatest challenges that being faced by the nanoscientists are the people working in the field of nanotechnology, especially in the developing country. So hands-on training and sharing of resources is critical. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know that there are people uh, around the globe, sometimes they are not willing to share their practice. So the only way is to uh, collaborate. Uh, one of the major challenges, uh, that is, uh, we have nanoscience and nanotechnology, uh, but you know that uh, nanoscience is not an individual subject. This is one of the key challenge for us. Like we say that uh, we have a subject like we have physics, uh, we have mechanical engineering or material science or aerospace engineering. And these, these, are, these are spectacular subjects but easily to understand. But when you come to nanoscience, uh, so, so you, you come to know that it's not an individual subject. Here we have uh, we, uh, uh, here we have the involvement from all the fields. That is, uh, it embraces all the traditional scientific disciplines and the field of engineering. That is, uh, you might know that the computer science mostly developed in 1960. Similarly, the bio, um, the biomedical uh, has been developed in 1990s. But when it comes to uh, nanoscience, uh, so nanoscience, uh, it takes the data, uh, it provides the data to almost every field of science and technology. I mean, uh, you can utilize uh, the nanoscience if you're working in computers, engineering or uh, computer science. Similarly, you can utilize the nanoscience uh, in biomedicals. You can utilize it in mechanical engineering, material science, civil engineering, physics, uh, uh, aerospace engineering and chemistry. So, uh, it said that it's not easy to work in the nanoscience. If you really want, uh, really trying to work, I really want to understand nanoscience, nanotechnology, you should have a bit of knowledge of almost all the field. I mean, depending upon your particular applications. So, uh, normally in our universities, uh, we have the basic courses, uh, and then after those basic courses, when you uh, when you take those courses, so after that you go for uh, specialization. I mean, you take a branch, and that particular branch, uh, you do the specializations. But if you really want to have, uh, 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 you really uh, want to have uh, uh, to have a hands on the uh, nanotechnology, uh, so you should you should keep in mind that nanotechnology is cross disciplinary area of technology. So what do you have to do, uh, or what is the problem, or what is the challenge with the uh, traditional education mode? So the traditional education mode is more suitable for single discipline teaching and learning. I mean, here, I mean, this point should be understood. We're saying that uh, nanotechnology is cross disciplinary area of technology. And the courses are the discipline we have at our, our university is mostly for single discipline. I mean, like we're saying that he's doing the bachelor, or he's doing the master uh, in physics or chemistry, or we're saying engineering, a particular engineering. But when we come to nanotechnology, so nanotechnology is cross-disciplinary, it involves many uh, disciplines. So what you have to do, uh, until unless we, we say that, here's, uh, um, we have a T, uh, a T structure, uh, just like in which we say that you should do basic courses, and those basic courses you should design and enter disciplinary structures. So unlike that, you should have, uh, we should have the undisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary structures, uh, and that should be, we say that based on the basic courses. Uh, what it means to say, it means to say that we should design our curriculum or we should design our courses such that uh, uh, it should have the concept of cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary or anti-disciplinary concept. Until unless we don't have this, so I think it will be still a great challenge for the, the people to train with the concept of the nanotechnology. Uh, without that, I think it's impossible to deal exactly with the uh, with the concept and doing of nanotechnology and the moderns uh, in the modern world. So these are some of the challenges uh, that we are facing uh, in the nanotechnology, especially the people working in the field of nanotechnology.